Did we just endure a 19 inning game seven of the World Series? Nope. It was the presidential election. This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CBAs, and welcome to episode 57. Today, we're going to talk about the wildest and weirdest presidential election in history. I'm sure it'll make it to the history books, and if you're young enough, which I'm not, I'm sure your grandchildren, or at least some of them, are probably going to ask you about it. What was it really like, Grandpa? Any election with Donald Trump was bound to be controversial. But when we threw in the coronavirus pandemic, we knew we were going to be in for quite a ride. And then to top things off, we had extremely close races in the battleground states where some of the vote tallies weren't completed until days after election day. And some are still too close to call. Much of the focus on the presidential race is on the nine battleground states because these are the states that everyone knew would decide the race. Almost all the other states were a foregone conclusion. Our guest today to discuss these issues is Bill Pascrell III. And no, he's not Congressman Bill Pascrell. That's his father. Bill is a lobbyist with the prestigious New Jersey lobbying firm, Princeton Public Affairs Group. He also served as the Passaic County Council for more than 10 years and has served as an advisor to more federal and state candidates than I can count. Full disclosure, Bill is a Democrat, which you'll probably all realize pretty early in the interview. But we wanted to tap into his vast experience working on national elections. In fact, you might remember him from one of our episodes earlier this year discussing the Democratic presidential primaries. So now here we are nine months after that episode with election results that are still not completely final because the president is contesting the results in court. Nonetheless, it's pretty clear that for all intents and purposes, the race is over and Joe Biden will be our next president. Because the status of the election results is changing every day, it's important to note that my conversation with Bill took place on November 11th. Welcome back, Bill. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Good to be here. Bill, let's start by looking at the battleground states, uh, which, as you know, pretty much decide who's going to be president. What do you see as the key issues uh, in these battleground states that led to a Biden victory? Well, I think I don't I don't know that there's an overall uh, issue. I think each battleground state is different. Um, I think that the fact that the vice president, Joe Biden, came from Scranton, Pennsylvania, knows the, uh, some of the rural and suburban areas pretty well. Um, I think he knew they had to uh, really uh, do an extraordinary job in um, uh, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia, and they did, getting 80-plus percent of the vote. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, the threat to the ACA and the threat to pre-existing conditions, uh, play, played a role across the country. Uh, but I think Pennsylvania in particular, uh, there was a incredible amount of, uh, power and energy put in, uh, by the Biden campaign. And I think, uh, fundamentally, just to be generic for a minute, I think President Trump, uh, probably uh, would have gotten reelected had he not been such a jibber jabber when he uh, tweets and talks about issues concerning race and civil justice uh, and and our foreign enemies. Uh, But I also think COVID, uh, you know, did play a role. The economy was number one uh, on on the national uh, polling, exit polling and and pre-election polling. COVID was certainly uh, significant. I think even though I'm a yellow dog Democrat, were it not for COVID, Trump probably would have got elected. And then you well, get down to, you know, the, 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 the Rust Belt and Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, and PA are what really delivered the White House to Joe Biden. Uh, 
Joe Biden will win Wisconsin by the number of votes uh, that Trump won Wisconsin by. And then the numbers in Michigan are extraordinary, where Trump barely eked out a victory in Michigan, and Biden's going to win it by 150 plus thousand votes. So do you think uh, Trump's personal attacks on Biden and his family backfired? No, I don't think that any voter this year cared about what Trump's tax returns were, uh, despite the fact that a a member of my family has been going after them for four years. Um, I don't think they cared that Trump paid $750, and I don't think anybody cared about Hunter Biden. What, What Americans are concerned about is the response to COVID, national security, our economy, and healthcare, the education of the children. That's what they cared about. And every time Trump started talking about Hunter Biden, I think it just fell over like a lead balloon. I don't think it moved the dial at all. Yeah, I agree. I don't I don't think most people even knew who Hunter Biden was. And like you said, they really weren't interested in Biden's uh, family and their personal problems uh, or Trump's family and, and their personal problems. But let's take a look at some of the key demographics in the battleground states. Uh, particularly among swing voters. How did Biden do with unaffiliated voters, which, you know, everybody refers to as independent voters? Yeah, undeclared voters, he did extraordinarily well, particularly with white educated uh, uh, voters. Um, You know, listen, uh, this election taught us a few lessons. Um, Number one, this election was a validation of Donald Trump because he got the second largest vote count of any American presidential candidate in the history of the country. And again, if Trump had been a little bit more measured and reasonable and not uh, been so, you know, just oftentimes reckless with his rhetoric, I think he would have had a chance to win this race. Um, But um, I, I also think that what Biden did, what Hillary Clinton was unable to do, was Biden was able to get to suburban educated white voters and bring them uh, sort of back across the middle line. Um, It made them comfortable. Biden is not a left-wing socialist. Uh, Trump tried to paint him as that. I also think in tribute to Joe Biden, uh, which he oftentimes doesn't get the credit he deserves, um, Joe Biden ran a pretty disciplined campaign. Um, He didn't get pushed off. I know personally he was very upset about the attacks on his son, but he didn't let uh, the Trump campaign drag him down the rabbit hole. And that was important. He stayed on message. I know that the Biden campaign is incredibly disappointed about Florida, but the firewall of Wisconsin, Michigan and PA delivered for them. And that's really all they needed to do. Right. Um, Looking at another group, how did Trump do with white? working class voters, mostly voters, let's say, who did not have a college education. I know he did very well with them in 2016. Did he repeat that uh, performance? He did better with them. Uh, Uneducated, white, middle class voters, the poor, white poor, uh, voted extraordinarily uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, Conversely, uh, minority voters, Uh, particularly Black women uh, and Latinos, uh, save uh, Florida. That's another story we should talk about. Right. Um, Labor. uh, Biden did much better amongst labor than Hillary Clinton did. And he did extraordinarily much better with, um, you know, as we said before, the white, educated suburban voter. Right, right. So, I mean, all in all, Biden did better with women than Hillary Clinton did, correct? Yes. That's interesting since... She was a woman, but I guess there was already a reservoir of uh, animus, I think, as you put it, towards Hillary Clinton way before she even ran. So how did the senior vote go in the battleground states? Let me just say that uh, it is extraordinarily difficult, Uh, although Kamala Harris has been able to shatter the glass ceiling a bit. It's extraordinarily difficult to run as a woman. As it is to run as a minority, you're held to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's just reality. Um, I don't think you should be, but that's just the reality of politics. Biden won the senior vote uh, overwhelmingly. Um, And, you know, the the irony of ironies is, and and the senior citizen vote 
<clears throat> was a very dicey vote this year because of COVID. Uh, yeah. But seniors are very reliable voters. And I also think that there was a tactical error made, uh, borderlining political malpractice for um, the Trump campaign and the president in particular to just um, pillory uh, and, and oppose mail-in ballots. Uh, we know that in all the swing states, battleground states, Biden did extraordinarily well in mail-in ballots. He didn't do as well at the, at the poll, the polling place, same day election day voters. And that's because Trump pushed his vote to election day. Right. Um, had he not been so vociferous against mail-in ballots, even though he voted um, uh, by mail-in ballot, I think he would have done better. Uh, you know, we saw the tracking in, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania, mail-in ballots were coming in nine to one uh, in Philadelphia, eight to two in Pittsburgh, uh, seven to three in Harrisburg. Um, you know, and across the country, the, the, the Biden did better amongst the, the pre-vote, the early vote, the mail-in ballot. And, you know, again, listen, I think it's all a part of a design to try to tee this up to delegitimize the integrity of the election, which is unfortunate. Right. Actually, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to your uh, colleague at your firm, Dave Smith, uh, on the phone, you know, during election. And at that point, Trump... Uh, Trump was doing very well, relatively speaking, in Pennsylvania. And Dave said, well, you know, I got friends down in Philadelphia and that's not going to last too long, his lead, because just like you said, uh, you know, they're doing Philadelphia now. And so far, the mail-in ballots are like eight or nine to, to one for Biden. So that that was interesting. And, and I think you're correct that. Uh, Trump made the mistake of uh, scaring away his voters from using the mail-in ballot. Um, but, you know, getting back to Florida, Trump won more Latino and African-American votes this year than he did in 2016. Is that correct? Yeah, he, he uh, as Biden trampolined ahead of Hillary on the white educated vote, uh, Trump um uh, did significantly better amongst Latino votes by about 13%, which was enough. Wow. A lot of that had to do with the Cuban vote, but also the Puerto Rican vote, which people are still analyzing. Um, Puerto Ricans, not just Cubans, uh, delivered a, a, a pretty sizable shift for Donald Trump. And that may have to do with uh, maybe the uh, success of his campaign in the Latino community. I know, uh, having worked uh, closely with the Biden campaign, uh, that Trump was spending 10 to 1 more than Joe Biden was on Latino uh, air commercials, radio and TV, uh, particularly in Florida. Very interesting. Yeah, and Florida, I know from traveling there, has a very large uh, Cuban population, and they have always, I believe, voted Republican, uh, in, in uh, especially in presidential elections. So Florida didn't surprise me. I guess... Uh, the his, uh, La Latino vote in other states did. But um, now let's look at something uh, the reverse. Did Trump lose many voters, Republican voters, to Biden? The last I heard, exit polls showed he got 6% of the Republicans. Does, does that sound right? And if it is right, is that higher than usual or, or is that the norm in a presidential election? Yeah, I think, you know, most, most times maybe four to six percent of Republicans would go the other way. Uh, I do think uh, that um, the, the data that I have from exit polling and the Biden campaign is not so much that, uh, you know, Biden did better amongst Republican voters. What Biden did was neutralize Republican turnout. Uh, I think many Republican voters uh, who tend to be traditional loyalists to the party and vote right down the party line, many of them stayed home uh, or did not vote at the top of the ticket. Uh, they were uncomfortable with Trump's style uh, or, or some of his uh, uh, behavior and his public commentary, um, but they would never vote for a Democrat, particularly Joe Biden. Right. So I, I think that's more the story and the lesson learned here. Um, uh, you know, because the fact of the matter is, is that 
uh, and I've said this before uh, uh, on, on television live and, and, and taped since election day. Uh, the thing that's curious to me is uh, the president's team is trying to stop the vote count where he's ahead and keep the vote counting where he's behind. And in addition to that, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric about a fraudulent election. But if it's fraudulent, uh, what does Mitch McConnell think about that? Because that's the same electorate that pretty much uh, saved this runoff election in Georgia, uh, put the Republicans back in the Senate and a majority and picked up at least eight Republican House seats. Um, so, you know, there wasn't a lot of down ballot, significant down ballot impact, just a little bit. Um, and, you know, I was very, very pleased and proud when the Republican Secretary of State and the Republican Lieutenant Governor of Georgia came out within the last 24 hours to say, hey, listen, we're, we're supporters of Trump, but there's no proof or evidence of voter fraud or voter um, invalidation here. Right. And, and I know some prominent Republicans like uh, former Governor Christie have said uh, the same thing. And, and uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be partisan, but I, I think it's clear. And I think most, if not all, most, uh, political observers would tell you that uh, there's no way there was any massive fraud and that uh, Trump is going to lose his lawsuits. What happens now? What's the process going forward? You know, the delegates and all that. And how does the president's lawsuits fit into that process? Well, the president has filed some 30 plus lawsuits. I happen to have read the ones he filed in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've said this again publicly. I don't say it uh, casually, uh, but I am an attorney. I've done a lot of election law. I am not the best of breed with election law, but I'm pretty, uh, pretty well suited. Uh, I was like totally amazed at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the pedestrian nature of the lawsuits. Um, one of the lawsuits, which Trump won, by the way, uh, was um, Friday. Uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania ruled that uh, the monitors, the legal team I was part of, we could now move from 10 feet away to six feet away. I, I mean, that was declared a Trump victory. God bless you. Congratulations, Mr. President. Um, there's another lawsuit that Lindsey Graham's been talking about, and Lindsey Graham's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I had immense respect. I've been in his company many times with Lindsey Graham up until this year. I think he's really uh, drank the Kool-Aid. But what Lindsey Graham said two days after the election was that he was going to start to push along with the Trump campaign to get the Pennsylvania legislature to change the way the electors uh, will be uh, certified uh, in Pennsylvania. Jeff, you know this, although you're not an attorney, you're a smart guy. Everybody that's going to potentially watch this uh, CPA podcast knows this. You don't change the rules after the game. In order to change the certification of electors, you had to do that prior to election day. So that lawsuit is going nowhere. Those legislators can change it all they want. It'll apply to the election in 2024. I mean, you know, talking about recounts, Biden's going to win Wisconsin by the same amount of votes that Trump won. Most, and, and this is empirical data, not my opinion, most of the uh, analytical data that's been done by uh, a host of media outlets, uh, the Woodrow Wilson School, the Kennedy School, uh, the Lyndon Johnson School in Texas, uh, all what I would say is objective academics. Every recount in the history of America with regard to federal elections, the most votes that are moved are between four and 500, not 22,000, not uh, 150,000, um, not 36,000. I mean, you might be able to move the dial. I was involved in Florio's recount in 1990 when he lost by 1,467 votes. Um, you know, and each day my dad and I would come home from the recount and Florio would be up eight. And the next day Tom Kane yeah. was up 12 and, you know, back and forth. Right. So recounts are not going to change the outcome of this. Um, what's unfortunate is um, you know, this is dragging it out and making us look even more 
uh, uh, imbecilic uh, in, in the views of uh, national leaders throughout the globe. But, you know, the electors meet the first week in December. Um, and so typically between seven and 10 days out, 10 days will be Friday, from a federal election, states will certify the outcomes. You'll start to see some states have already, although counting is a little slower, obviously, because of the mailing. You'll start to see over the next week, state after state after state certifying those elections. If you have uh, in certain states uh, like uh, Georgia, where the difference, uh, if it's less than a half a point, uh, you have an automatic recount. If it's more than a half a point, then the losing campaign has to pay for the recount. And that will drag on a little bit, but this is not, there's no instance where we're getting close to what happened in Florida in 2000, which I was involved in as well, uh, where the difference in the vote was 300 and it ended up being two and change. Um, right, right. So, so I don't you, see any of these lawsuits being successful. What do you think the odds are uh, that uh, President Trump will concede if he loses, you know, all his court cases are there, are there, are there, or they are never uh, heard. Uh, and I know pretty difficult to predict anything uh, with President Trump, but do you have any hunch or thoughts that he'll actually say, all right, uh, I now finally agree I lost and, uh, you know, thank you or welcome President Trump. Uh, elect Biden. Do you think that'll ever happen, that he'll concede? Well, let me say a couple of things. First of all, I used to represent Trump and the organization in uh, early 2000s in what is Atlantic City properties. As you know, I do a lot of work in the casino industry. So I've been in his company uh, multiple times, not recently, certainly not since he's been president. He is an extraordinarily uh, talented individual. Uh, he is a extraordinary well-versed TV personality. I think he should uh, learn to take advice more from people who are experts. I think he has perfected being a non-politician. Uh, I still think people viewed him as the outsider, even though he was the insider. All that being said, I am hopeful, but I am not optimistic. Uh, I, meaning I'm hopeful that he will do the right thing and concede. Every president in the history of our country uh, uh, has received that. Um, don't forget, it's very rare to be an incumbent president. It doesn't happen a lot. Uh, right, right. That's you know. true. So what happens uh, so if he physically... What happened was when Clinton beat Bush, uh, Reagan beat Carter. Uh, but it, it's rare, is what I'm saying. But I don't think it's in Trump's DNA or his nature. Uh, he hasn't surprised me uh, along the way uh, because he's never changed his tune. Every time he's kind of said absurd things, put his foot in his mouth, and it's all the things that I didn't create, everybody knows about, uh, he just continued to double down. So, I, I mean, I think what he's trying to do is continue to be relevant as a loser, create Trump TV, and try to keep everybody in lockstep with him and fearful of him so that he can get what he needs, maybe from a business point of view and get the nomination in four years and try to make a comeback. Interesting. Um, are there any procedures uh, that that are would be put in place, or I imagine it's probably never even been considered, but let's say he physically won't leave the White House come January, what would happen? Would they just oust him physically or, or nobody really knows what the process would be? No, it's pretty, it's pretty clear. Uh, once the electors have voted and the election's been certified and Joe Biden is declared and certified the winner, now obviously a lot of stuff has occurred. He's already getting the, uh, the heightened Secret Service protection. His home in, in Delaware is already getting uh, that that fortress around it or that wall around it, if you will, right. the security wall. Um, but if if I, I think I would be surprised by this if Donald Trump hunkers down in the White House. Um, I don't think you're going to see him do what is typically done by ex-presidents when a new president comes in is and welcome Joe Biden. 
Uh, I don't think you're going to see him fly away in a helicopter and wave and all that. Um, but I, I, I don't think we're going to have to send in SEAL Team 6 uh, <laughs> to support him out. At least I hope not. But if he were to stay hunkered down in the Oval Office and say, I'm not moving, the military will come in, not with force, but will remove him uh, as, as a bailiff would in a courtroom. Uh, and, and I think, um, I think that would be really, uh, a terrible thing. Um, uh, I, I, I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, I, I don't know what he gains by that. And quite candidly, Jeff, uh, and I don't want to give legal strategy to the president or his team, but I think the president should be extraordinarily concerned about what may come out of the Southern district in New York the day after he leaves office or probably 15 minutes after he leaves office with potential indictments. He may want to curry favor with Joe Biden and in exchange for a gracious exit, secure a commitment from Joe Biden to be uh, pardoned. Um, whether Joe would, Joe Biden would do that or not, I have no idea, but I mean, he's going to be in a pretty vulnerable situation. Um, and I think he's going to lose a lot of the uh, sort of moderate support that he has, um, you know, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times from my partners and friends who are Trump supporters. When I was upset four years ago when Hillary lost, uh, you know, he's the president. He's the president for all the people. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, having that same apply conversely. Right, right. Um, let's take a look at what we might expect uh, when uh Biden takes over. And uh, what do you think will be his first initiatives, his major signature things that he's going to push for during well, his first year? A lot of that's going to depend upon the outcome of the runoffs in, uh, in Georgia, which are on January 5th. Um, I think those are huge challenges for the Democrats because it's hard enough to get people motivated to vote once. It's really hard to get them to vote twice in, in the period of 60 days, uh, right after the, you know, the holidays and all, and, and to keep that going. It's hard. Uh, yeah. They could win. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, the odds on favorites are the Republicans there to get reelected. Um, if that happens, then Biden's um, term or hundred, first hundred days are going to be very different. He's already talking about, uh, overturning via executive order, a lot of the orders that were put in place um, that, um, uh, you know, the Biden campaign and the Democrats were upset about. Um, I think he's going to have a tough task uh, with a legislative agenda. Uh, I mean, we'll have to see with the Supreme Court, which just heard the case yesterday on the ECA. Uh, they're not going to come back uh, with a decision on that till next year. Uh, I think if the decision is that the pre-existing conditions are no longer required, I think Biden will double down on that for sure. I think right. Biden's going to I think Biden's going to do some things. Biden is very smart when it comes to legislative maneuvering. He's the guy that got a lot of the stuff done legislatively that Obama uh, wasn't able to do uh, as vice president. He got that done, including the ACA. Yes. Um, what I think what I think he'll do. Uh, and I agree with this. And I thought that that's something that uh, Trump should have done uh, and didn't do. Go right at an issue which everybody in America supports. A uh, labor supports it. Business people support it. You and I support it, whether we're R or D, and that's infrastructure. We have a dying airport system, a dying rail system, a dying road system. It creates jobs in every state. It's a bipartisan issue. That's a huge, smart thing. And I guarantee you, Joe Biden is going to go forward with that because I think he can get McConnell to move on that. I also think that uh, I'm not optimistic <coughs> that the Republicans are going to move in the Senate on the you know fifth round of uh, COVID relief. Uh, but I think that Biden's going to have to do something along those lines. Uh, I think he's also going to be uh, you know doing some, uh, which will be hard to do with the Republican Senate be easier to do if it's a 50-50 tie with Kamala Harris breaking the tie as the vice president. <clears throat> and that is to say a civil justice reform and voting rights act of reforms, which are needed. We really need to do a job bipartisan, not a partisan job. 
to making these elections a little bit more uniform across the country um, because they're, the election process is still very um, uh, out of date and antiquated. Regarding uh, Trump's hardcore supporters, not just anybody who voted for him, but you, you know, the people who were like blocking the New Jersey uh, Garden State Parkway and you see these people at rallies. You think that they are going to dissipate as a powerful political force, you know, once Biden assumes office and the new Congress gets going? Or do you think they'll or do you think they'll stay on the scene as a, a significant political movement? They are going to stay on the scene. <clears throat> They'll be even more beefed up because Trump's not going away. Um, I don't feel that um, they are a threat uh, in any way politically or security wise, but they can essentially be handled very easily uh, like was done in Michigan, uh, like was done earlier today in New York with the, the threat on the life of Chuck Schumer. Um, wow. You know, I, I, I think that we have uh, wackos and radicals on both sides of the aisle, and they all should be treated with equal force. That's not America. Um, I've always been a, a, a big, big fan and student of quiet civil disobedience. When you don't like something, you don't threaten other people's lives. I am very concerned, as I was concerned for Donald Trump. I am very concerned about the life and safety and security of our president, our new president, our president-elect, and the vice president-elect. Um, the, the stuff that happened in Michigan earlier this year was riveting and, and bone chilling. And uh, it's very sad. But, you know, I think what Joe Biden won't do, Jeff, and I hope people will appreciate this coming from a talk, I'm talking as a father uh, and, and, and a parent of four children, uh, I hope people understand that Joe Biden is not the type of guy that's going to add kerosene to a fire. He's going to try to put water on that fire. He's going to try to put it out. He's going to try to talk to people civilly. He never used the word as Hillary did despicable. Remember right. that? Yeah, um, I do. So, so, you know, I mean, listen, and Joe Biden understands that we can think in our minds as Democrats oh my God, how could anybody vote for Donald Trump? But I know people who I uh, respect immensely who voted for him. I know that many Republicans were uncomfortable with the president and his behavior and his comments. And so they chose to sit it out. And that's fine. That's okay. Yep. Uh, or maybe they wrote in Mickey Mouse, who knows? Um, <laughs> but but you know, the biggest challenge Joe Biden has is to heal the country. And that's going to take a lot of time. It's not, there's no one magic bullet or God forbid, you know, a uh, peace initiative you can offer. Right. Right. So let's, uh, before we wrap up, let's take a quick look at uh, New Jersey elections. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, uh, in this state, Biden did well as expected taking, I think it was 58% of the vote, all the democratic congressional incumbents won. Um, while only 6% of the Republicans nationally, and we discussed this before, uh, abandoned, Trump, abandoned Trump, it seems to me, and this is just an impression, could be wrong, seems to me like the defection rate amongst Republicans in New Jersey uh, was much higher. Um, I heard, I uh, didn't see the actual tally, but was tracking the election results in, in Morris County. And that seemed to imply that there was, you know, a lot of leakage uh, in Republican support. It, is my impression correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to pick up a freeholder seat on the Democratic side of the aisle. The, the legislative races are still tight there. The, the Buco race, and the assembly race, Somerset County continues to trend the other way after being, you know, lock rib, lockstep Republican for over 40 years. Uh, every countywide officer in that county now will be Democrat. Uh, there's other parts of the state. The most Trumpian part of the state are the southern six counties uh, where the Van Drew district is. Right. Um, it, but, you know, listen, uh, to be honest, 
one of the big winners election night, and this is not going to be readily apparent to the casual observer, is, uh, you know, the Republican candidates for governor, uh, someone like Jack Chitterelli. Had Donald Trump gotten reelected, whether Jersey voted for him or not, um, I would say the chances are zero for a Republican to be elected governor next year. Phil Murphy remains very popular. He's handled the, the COVID virus extraordinarily well. He just got a budget he wanted uh, with something I was opposed to, the millionaire's tax, and he got Senate President Sweeney to come along. Uh, but you know what happens, Jeff, and you know this well because you've been involved in politics your whole adult life. Uh, look at the, the Clinton election. Clinton got elected. Christy Todd Whitman got elected the next year. Look at the Obama election. Obama got elected. Chris Christie got elected the next year. Look at the Trump election. Trump got elected. Phil Murphy got elected the next year. We have a history in modern day New Jersey politics of balancing going back and forth. So there's two things. I think the Republicans now have a little bit better chance because a lot of times, you know, the first six months of any presidency, you get frustrated. You know, things aren't happening fast enough or things are happening too fast. And who do you take it out on? You take it out on the gubernatorial candidates. Number two, uh, the other thing I would say, and again, uh, not casually obvious, um, I don't think it's the end of the world for Joe Biden to have a 52-48 Republican Senate, because I think that will help him with moderating the party a little bit. Um, he'll be under tremendous pressure, as you talked about earlier, from the far left uh, to do things more uh, expediently uh, should they take control of the Senate. And uh, that's when you oftentimes have a bloodbath, as Obama and Clinton did, uh, and Trump in the midterm. Right. The first yeah. midterm election, they all got slaughtered. So right. Jersey is remains one of the bluest of blue states. You know, we only have uh, two Republican uh, Congress people. Everyone else uh, in the congressional delegation is a Democrat. The governor is a Democrat, the lieutenant governor. Um, the majority of our legislatures, overwhelmingly uh, the majority of our county office holders. But, you know, that can switch on a dime. Yeah. And so I think Governor Murphy's very um, uh, uh, learned on that. I think he's not taking his popularity for granted because as quick as it can come, it can go. Yeah, look uh, at Chris Christie, right? <laughs> 60 or 70 percent down to 15 percent uh, approval rating in like two or three years. Uh, I also want to say this and, and, and sort of I guess if we're kind of closing here, I give a lot of credit to Mitt Romney, to Colin Powell to uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, McCain uh, and to Chris Christie um, and to a handful of other Republicans around the country like John Kasich, who have all tried to uh, bring measure to this post-election. I'm not talking about endorsing Joe Biden. I'm talking about Chris Christie most recently saying that, you know, Mr. President, it's time to move on. Uh, more people need to do that. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that will happen uh, so that we can start to get back to get off the political agenda because we're all tired of it. I am, uh, and start to get back to sort of bringing this country back together again. Well, Bill, thank you. Uh, as always, uh, I found what you had to say extremely interesting. I got stuff to talk, uh, stuff to talk about at cocktail parties. Uh, I am not going to give you credit. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to kind of act like I came up with these insights myself. Um, but uh, really appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure uh, I'll either be talking to you or hopefully seeing you live uh, in person soon. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much.